The First Gulf War, or First Persian Gulf War, which lasted from August 1990 to February 1991, was a reaction to the Iraqi invasion and annexation of Kuwait. A coalition force led by the United States fought to liberate Kuwait. The war was an asymmetric war as coalition forces had significantly more advanced levels of military technology, including tanks strategy and training, than Iraqi forces. The majority of Iraqi tanks were T-72M that had been built in the Soviet Union Czechoslovakia and Poland. The T-72M is an export version of the USSR's T-72. They also had Soviet T-54-55s, T-62s, and PT-76, as well as some Chinese Type 59s and Type 69s tanks. On the other side, the United States was the leader of the coalition, and its tank force was dominated by the M1A1 Abrams. Other important coalition tanks during the war were Britain's Challenger 1 and France AMX-30. There were also some American M60 Pattons and British Centurions. Most of the coalition countries used Western tanks, exceptions were Egypt and Syria, which had Soviet tanks. This video focuses on the parameters which Iraq could have adopted to win the Gulf War. As they were in defensive and dug in positions still they were defeated due to a number of reasons. And if they had overcome those issues, the Iraqi armor could have been able to defend against coalition forces. The first major issue was the imbalance of weapons technology. Iraq chooses quantity over quality, most of the Iraqi tanks were export versions that did not have access to the latest ammunition and the latest technological upgrades. For example, in Western tanks, night vision equipment was standard. However, most Iraqi tanks lacked night sights, although some T-55s had infrared searchlights. T-72 tanks were armed with an excellent 125mm smoothbore weapon and had many of the same advanced features found on the Abrams. Despite its advanced design, the T-72 proved to be inferior to the M1A1s deployed during the Gulf War, in fact, compared more closely with the older M60A3 tanks. On the other side, Abram tanks had vision devices that proved effective, not only at night, but also in the dust and smoke of Kuwaiti daytime. On average, an Abrams outranged an Iraqi tank by about 1,000 meters. Due to lack of sight, Iraqi tanks were being hit by units they could not even see. Another issue was obsolete fire control systems. On contrary coalition tanks including Abram and Challenger were equipped with advanced FCS. If Iraqi army tanks have night sight, or they manage to acquire T-80U tank from Russia then result could have been completely different. Night operation will enable them to maneuver their forces in different directions and flank from weak sides. Another problem was improper air defense and air cover, most Iraqi armor columns were exposed to coalition air attacks. American AH-64 Apache helicopters and A-10 Warthogs fighter jets with thermal target equipment as cover and blow up parked tanks, while Iraqi soldiers were helpless in them. Coalition troops were able to use air attacks to destroy Iraqi tanks before the ground war even started. A problem with the Iraqi SAM systems was the mix of older and newer equipment. In some cases, the more modern SA-6 system was withdrawn from the frontline army units it was designed to protect and replaced or supplemented by aging SA-2 or SA-3 missile systems. Their tactical employment, firing doctrine, and crew training were heavily influenced by Soviet doctrine that as large numbers of anti-aircraft artillery weapons supported by surface-to-air missiles concentrated in certain areas leaving weak zones. Most of these systems were deployed to protect cities and high-value targets. Armor on the other hand relied on AAA towed and self-propelled guns for defense. Further, there was no long-range system in their arsenal, if they had S-300P to defend cities and strategic areas. Then it would relieve short-range missile systems for tactical air defense on fronts. For example, the 2K-12 Cub deployed with armor, having an effective range of 24 kilometers, could easily defend against Apache and Warthog. At least the effectiveness of coalition air cover would have to be limited, Apache was using Hellfire missiles and A-10 was using AGM-65 Maverick missiles. After obsoleteness of equipment, improper planning and lack of information about coalition forces was another loophole. There was no proper planning and coordination between army units. Their information channels were so weak that coalition tanks were able to advance so quickly that sometimes they arrived at enemy positions before the Iraqi troops even received warning of an attack. 
Further Iraqi army used its tanks as fixed anti-tank and artillery pieces, digging them into the ground to reduce target signature. However, this also prevented their quick movement and Allied air power smashed nearly 50% of Iraq's tank threat before Allied armor had moved across the border. After that, Abrams quickly destroyed a number of Iraqi tanks that did manage to move. The absence of early warning aircraft also create problems for both the Iraqi Air Force and Army, there was no advanced information available to plan defense accordingly. The only platform available was only 9 MiG-25RB reconnaissance bomber. On the opposite side, coalition units have state-of-the-art SIGINT, E-3 Sentry AWACS, electronic warfare, and reconnaissance aircraft. If Iraqi units have prior early warning and proper planning the result could have been completely different. In conclusion, if the Iraqi army had advanced tanks like T-80U or their T-72s equipped with night fighting devices, air defense cover, and air support aircraft, elements of reconnaissance and intelligence gathering systems with proper planning and training, their situation would be manageable. If not victorious at least their losses could have been minimal, 